Ladies and gentlemen, please stand by. Your webinar is about to begin. Please use the volume control on your computer to adjust the sound for this presentation. Good day and welcome everybody to the Canadian Obesity Network public webinar series. Today's presentation is Sleep, Exercise and Obesity. My name is Don Hatanaka. I'm the Education Director for the Canadian Obesity Network and I'll be hosting today's webinar. This public webinar series is an exciting opportunity for the Canadian Obesity Network to interact with Canadians to, to disseminate credible and evidence-based information about obesity. Through this platform, experts will be weighing in on issues on obesity, bias and discrimination, prevention, treatment, policy and more. And if you'd like to be part of our public community and want to be first to hear about future webinars, please become a member at obesitynetwork.ca backslash public and opt in for our newsletter. An archive of this webinar will be posted and available for viewing on the obesitynetwork.ca webinars page. Due to the extremely high volume of requests to join this presentation, we have disabled microphone and question and answer features. However, we do want to answer any questions you might have. So if you have questions you'd like to ask the speakers, you may do so via social media or in the evaluation survey at the end of this presentation. We have two great speakers today, closing out our 2016 webinar series with a look at the importance of and relationship between exercise, sleep, and weight. First, Dr. Alana LeBlanc, Knowledge Manager for Participation, will provide an overview of that organization's 2016 report card on physical activity for children and youth which for the first time included a grade on sleep and new Canadian 24 hour movement guidelines. Then we'll hear from Dr. Jean-Philippe Chaput, research scientist at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, who will de demystify how a lack of sleep makes us vulnerable to weight gain. And now I'd like to pass it over to Dr. LeBanc. Thanks so much, Don, and thanks so much for having us here today. So as Don mentioned, I will be presenting results from the 2016 Participation Report Card on Physical Activity for Children and Youth, and try to at least shed a little bit of light on the question, are Canadian kids too tired to move? You can see my contact information there, and you can also feel free to visit the Participation website at www.participation.com. So the report card this year looked at the relationship between physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep. And to stem the creeping sleep epidemic, tried to understand that kids need to get off the couch, get outdoors, and get their hearts pumping regularly. We like to say it's time for a wake-up call. Canadians sit less and move more. We will all sleep better. The report card this year really highlighted the idea that kids are inactive and they may be losing sleep over it. So we looked at the idea that kids are too tired to get enough physical activity during the day. And then because they're not active during the day, then they're not tired enough to sleep at night. So it really looked at this cycle of inactivity, not enough sleep, more inactivity, even less sleep, and on and on. And we do know that children's nightly sleep duration has decreased by about 30 to 60 minutes over the last few decades. So kids are getting less and less sleep, either for, uh, further suggesting this idea that kids are getting not enough physical activity than not enough sleep. We know that about a third of school-aged children and youth are not getting enough uh, sleep each night. And so we'll look at that a little bit more as we get into the sleep guidelines. And Dr. Shep, you will We'll look at this even more during the later part of this presentation. So as Don mentioned, we're, we're looking at the results of the 2016 participation report card. So for those of you who don't know, this is actually the 12th year of the report card and the second year that participation has produced the report card. It basically looks at the all the evidence around physical activity in children and youth from across Canada and provides uh, grades on 12 indicators. So we have a group of researchers across the country and they kind of just look at how well kids are doing from a whole whole day perspective. And as Don mentioned, this year we included the new Canadian 24 hour movement guidelines for children and youth an integration of physical activity, sedentary behavior and sleep. And in part due to these guidelines, we assigned a grade to sleep for the first time in the report card. So looking at the Canadian 24-hour movement guidelines, these are really cool and they are for a couple reasons. One is that 
Canadians are the first to look at this 24 hour period and assign guidelines for the whole day. So looking at the interrelationship between all different types of movement. And this is actually the knowledge product that was included in this year's report card. The guidelines were informed by a whole bunch of research scientific evidence from researchers from Canada and around the world. So they had a really great research team to develop these guidelines. And they're actually, all this research is captured in a special issue in Applied Metabolism, Nutrition, Applied Physiology, Nutrition, and Metabolism, so AP and M. So it's the, it's the journal from the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology. And CSEP is actually the organization that owns these guidelines. You see the guidelines here, and just to highlight across the bottom, although CSEP owns the guidelines, they were produced in partnership with Participation, the Public Health Agency of Canada, the Conference Board of Canada, and the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario uh, Research Institute, so where, where JP is actually housed, so at the Healthy Active Living and Obesity Research Group. And as I mentioned, the guidelines really highlight the four speeds of childhood. So this idea that all behaviors are connected and we can break them down to sweat, step, sleep, and sit. And I'll go into these a little bit more detail um, in the next couple of slides, but you can see the guidelines themselves along, along the side there. So sweat is really the moderate to vigorous activity, and kids need at least 60 minutes of this activity per day, and we'll go, go into a little bit of what that means. And then step is the light activity, so the unstructured and structured kind of light moving around throughout the day. Then we go on to sleep, and sleep we understand is, or understanding is more and more important for children uh, and youth. And JP will go into that into greater detail later, and kind of this side of the effects with obesity and other lifestyle behaviors. Um, but children need a, these are the first of the Canadian guidelines for sleep. There's guidelines in other parts of the world, but these are the first sleep guidelines in Canada. And they suggest that kids need at least nine hours of sleep per night and adolescents need at least eight hours of sleep per night. This is the consistent, the consistent bed, consistent wake times that are needed as well. And then sit and that sedentary behavior. And we're really talking about screen time when we're talking about sedentary behavior. So no more than two hours per day of recreational screen time. So, so as I mentioned, I'd provide a few more details on the, the different behaviors. So, Sweat can be broken into moderate and then vigorous intensity activities. We, the higher the intensity is better, but we want at least moderate intensity. So this is getting kids to sweat at least a little bit. They're getting out of breath, they're huffy, huffing and puffing, they're getting their blood flowing. So they're getting the activity that we really think kids need. And then the vigorous activities, we may not be able to sustain these for long periods, but that's really, that's all out play. That's really running to during a soccer game or those high intensity activities. So we need a combination of those throughout the week. The step is the light intensity activities. So as I mentioned, this includes both structured and unstructured activities, like playing quietly. So maybe they're playing a board game and they're moving around quietly throughout the indoors or outside, maybe they're playing in a sandbox or walking the dog slowly or something like that. So normally these activities won't cause children to be out of breath, but are really important. And as we highlighted in last year's report card, it is import important for kids to get these types of activities outdoors and sometimes unmonitored. So letting kids be kids and roam free a little bit. So if you're getting enough activity, so at least 60 minutes of the moderate to vigorous intensity activity, so this sweat part at the top, um, we know that this activity helps to improve kids' health, it helps them to do better in school, it improves self-esteem and, self and confidence, it helps to maintain a healthy body weight, and improves fitness. So all of these are really good and really, really important for healthy child growth and development. We then go on to sleep and sit. So sleep, as I mentioned, and we've said a couple of times, is the newest part of these Canadian guidelines and the newest addition to the report card. So we know that sleep is essential component of healthy development and is required for physical and mental health. And we're seeing that sufficient sleep and good quality sleep provide some of the same benefits is at least, uh, is higher levels of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity. So we're understanding that is really, really important. The sit, on the other hand, we're understanding how detrimental excessive sedentary behavior can be. So although sedentary behavior includes screen time and other activities that require little movement, so sitting in a car or being restrained in, in a stroller or anything like that, we kind of understand that the sedentary behavior that involves screen, so TVs, tablets, iPhones, all that kind of stuff, is actually maybe more detrimental. 
it, it is associated with other negative behaviors that we don't necessarily see if a child is, say, reading a book. We also know that the, the sedentary behavior, especially the screen-based sedentary behavior, can impact other more beneficial behaviors, such as sleep. So we know that every hour that a kid spends in sedentary activities delays their bedtime by three minutes. And average children and youth spends about eight and a half hours being sedentary per day. And this eight and a half hours, of course, does include school time. But this is just to highlight that excessive sedentary behavior, especially screen time, especially as we're getting into the recreational, so later at night, can also delay sleep onset. So now we're going to highlight some indicators and grades. So these are, are what we really showed in the report card. And again, this is based on the best available evidence from across Canada. And the grades are assigned by a team of pediatric researchers from across Canada. So the overall grade for physical activity is a D. So most kids are not getting enough physical activity. In fact, only about 9% of Canadian children and youth are getting the 60 minutes of heart pumping, pumping physical activity they need each day. We've had a D for the past four years for physical activity. The only reason it's not lower, to be quite honest, is because the younger children, so the children aged three to four, a lot more of them are meeting their physical acti activity recommendations of at least 180 minutes or three hours of physical activity at any intensity. So this also includes light physical activity, so the kind of playing quietly, all that kind of stuff. Um, but we do also know that as the guidelines change, so they get to 60 minutes for the children and youth, 14% of children are meeting the guidelines, and 5% of youth are meeting the guidelines. So we know that as they get older, kids are getting less and less active. The next grade we look at is for active play, and this is also a D. And so active play can be thought of as this light physical activity, so the step part of the new guidelines. We know that very few children are playing outdoors for at least two hours per day. To bring that into something that may make a bit more sense, those kids that are getting enough outdoor activity, especially after school, which is where a lot of this occurs, they're the kids who are also more likely to meet the physical activity guidelines, so the 60 minutes per day of moderate to vigorous activity. So we know that this part is, is really important, so get outside and be active. And the more kids are outside, the more active they are. We can also see, and if you look at the graph below, that as we get older, and if we look between boys and girls, that their time being active outdoors um, decreases a lot. So there's more people that are active less than one hour per day. But if you look at the more than four hours per day, not many kids are getting to that benchmark. All that to say, even though, and parents think that kids are getting the next activity, um, unstructured activity or activity after school per day. The next grade we see is a B. And this is a grade for sleep. And as we mentioned, this is the first time that we've assigned a grade for sleep. And you know what? A B is not that bad if you look at it in isolation. But this also highlights the idea that there was a creeping sleep epidemic. So about a third of children and adolescents are not getting enough sleep per night. This is really a cause for concern, especially as we move forward and we, we are doing better at actually measuring sleep per night in kind of the general population. So we know that 79% of 5 to 13 year olds get enough sleep and 68% of 14 to 17 year olds get enough sleep. So again, this highlights that younger kids doing a little bit better, but sleep time decreases as they get older. And we also know that some kids, even if they're not, and youth, even if they're getting enough sleep, they're not getting enough good quality sleep. And there are some research gaps in this area where we can properly measure what it means to get enough Sleep. But I'm sure you can understand anecdotally yourself or maybe your child or you that if you didn't have enough sleep or enough good quality sleep the night before, you maybe don't feel so great the next day. You may even be a little bit cranky or have trouble concentrating. The behavior that we're going to talk about is sedentary behaviors. And unfortunately, this grade actually went down this year to an F. So most kids are failing in the sedentary behavior department. This is largely due to the number of children that are meeting current screen time guidelines. So if you look in the figure below, you can see that the three to four year old kids, only 15% are meeting guidelines of less than one hour per day of recreational screen time. As we move to children and youth, 
they get a little bit higher guidelines, so less than two hours per day of recreational screen time, and we can see they're doing slightly better, not much. So about a quarter of children and youth are meeting screen time guidelines. That means that 76% of children and youth are watching in excess of two hours of recreational screen time per day. Like I mentioned before, this not only includes TV, but also video games, tablets, cell phones, iPhones, all that kind of stuff as well. So finally, we're going to look at some recommendations on how to get Canadian kids to sit less and move more and basically meet the new physical activity guidelines and hopefully improve their grades across the board. Some recommendations for the overall physical activity part, so the sweat part of the guidelines, to widely disseminate the new 24-hour movement guidelines. The reason for this is to help people understand how the whole day really matters and the interrelationship between different types of movement behaviors. Support children and youth by adding in bouts of physical activity throughout the day. So maybe a break at school, maybe a break after school, maybe a fit break throughout the evening. This is really important because as opposed to in adults where we need the physical activity to be accumulated in bouts of at least 10 minutes, in children we recognize that they have a pretty sporadic nature. So they'll accumulate kind of a minute of physical activity here, a couple minutes there. So every minute counts when we're trying to get to that 60 minute goal. Remove barriers for low income families by ensuring there are simple and dignified ways to access programs. This really highlights the need that all children, so no matter of their socioeconomic status, should be able to access programs after school in their communities and on weekends to get them more active. This also helps um, get them the skills and, and encouragement that they need for a lifetime of physical activity. And finally, focus on overall health, not specifically weight loss when we're talking about physical activity. More and more, we know that the relationship between physical activity and weight loss is not great. That being said, we know that physical activity is hugely beneficial for overall health. Some recommendations for active play. So the step part of the guidelines or the light intensity part of the guidelines. The number one is to increase awareness and understanding of the benefits versus the risks of outdoor play. Like I mentioned, last year in the report card, we had a position statement on active outdoor play that really stated that children should get active, sometimes active alone, um, after school, on weekends, everything, and that the more they spend time outdoors, the more active they are. We're not telling kids to court danger, but, they're, but a little bit of risk is okay. Encourage parents to ensure a balance between structured and unstructured play. This suggests that we don't just need to get kids signed up for various sports teams or, or phys ed programs or anything like that, but let kids be kids. You can give them some equipment, say a ball, a rope, all that kind of stuff, but just let them make up games and have fun. And then challenge municipal bylaws and school policies that restrict opportunities for active outdoor play. And I'm sure you've all heard it and seen it in the news ball bands, street hockey bands, bands for playing with snow, all of this kind of stuff. So we really need to, to make a voice be heard and get these, these reversed. This is happening in Toronto right now with our street hockey ban. It's currently underway of getting reversed, which is really awesome. But we need to work on this throughout Canada in both big urban centers and small rural locations. For sleep, and Dr. Shafi will talk about some more recommendations around sleep and and how this uh, affects different parts of health, but encourage families to develop household bedtime rules. And I like to say not just for kids, but adults as, as well. Turn off the screens before bed, have consistent bed and wake times, both during the week and on weekends. Second one is to delay school, time, school start times for adolescents. So sometimes adolescents are forced to get up early. Their bodies aren't ready to get up. They need more sleep. Delaying school start times is an effective strategy to allow adolescents to get a bit more sleep. Next one is we should take sleep more seriously in our busy work obsessed society. And we really highlighted this in the report card this year is the over programming, the over complicated lives that we're leading right now where we like to plan out every single minute. Sometimes that ends up pushing our work day for adults or our work day for kids, i.e. they have so many boxes to check that they don't end up being able to go to sleep until very, very late. And the last one is regard sleep as a preventative me measure for weight gain and overall health. Finally, recommendations for sedentary behavior. So the sit part of the guidelines. 
So similar to sleep, encourage families to develop household rules around screen time. And again, similar to sleep, I like to highlight that this is needed for not just children and adolescents, but parents and, and adults as well. So you know what, turn off your screens after eight o'clock. Decide that you're not gonna use screens on the weekend or you'll have only one hour of screen time per day, that kind of stuff, and try to really stick to it. Sometimes these things take a little bit of time until we can wean ourselves off, but I think it's really important. Uh, some novel things would be to turn off the internet in the home at children's bedtime or even earlier, so from evening to the morning. So this can reduce the amount of getting up in the middle of the night to check who texted you or the latest YouTube video or anything like that. In line with that is remove screens and media devices from the bedroom. This is a really important for not only sleep, but also um, weight gain, decreased physical activity. There's a ton of research suggesting that screens in the bedroom is just a bad idea. And parents should set limits around their own screen time, like I said, but also the screen time use and make sure that this isn't a punishment. This is just what you do. For example, you wouldn't have cotton candy for breakfast. That's just not a healthy breakfast. So you know what, we're not gonna have use screens after dinner, that's just not what we do. It's not a punishment, just make it the new norm. And finally, when engaging in screen time, so those times that you do have a family movie night, you're playing on the tablet, whatever, be vigilant around energy intake as well. So don't make screen time an excuse for snack time. And if you do have snacks, try to make sure that the healthier snacks, so fruits, vegetables, rather than potato chips and candy bars. So now that we're done with some recommendations, we're, I'm gonna pass on the, the screen to Dr. Shapu and he's gonna talk about um, a good night's sleep to control body weight. Thank you very much. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Jean-Philippe Chapu, and I'm very happy to continue the conversation on exercise, sleep, and body weight. Uh, especially here, uh, we will dig deeper on the link between lack of sleep and weight gain. And I will try to convince you that having a good night's sleep is as important as having a good diet and exercise. And I hope that I will not be too sleepy during my presentation. Okay, so we know that we sleep less nowadays compared to a couple of years, a couple of decades ago. Uh, this is mainly true in children and teenagers. Uh, you have a here one study with a large sample of kids from 20 countries around the world uh, between 1905 and 2008 and the main finding is a decrease of more than one hour of sleep over the last 100 year and we know that if we dig deeper here it, it's uh, this decline in sleep is more important in teenagers than school age kids and especially on, on weekdays. So if we think about measures to counteract that, I think uh, we need to find solutions on weekdays because kids need to attend schools and maybe things like uh, if we delay school start times can be a good measure to make sure that kids uh, are not tired uh, on, on weekdays. What about our Canadian kids? I think uh, Alana talked about this. Roughly one third of our Canadian kids and teenagers are sleep deprived, so don't sleep enough according to the sleep guidelines that uh, we talked before. Uh, we know that long sleepers in Canada are pretty rare. So about 1% are long sleepers and one third are short sleepers. So the, the real risk is about lack of sleep and not sleeping too much. And we know that there is a lot of catch-up sleep on weekends as well. So uh, mainly one hour more of sleep duration on Saturdays and Sundays compared to weekdays. So if we want to find strategy solutions, I think we need to uh, focus more on weekdays. So what are the sleep guidelines, sleep uh, recommendations? Uh, Alana talked about that. So the one that people tend to use the most is the US ones from the National Sleep Fund Foundation. Uh, the Canadian ones are very similar. So, for example, for school-age kids, uh, the recommendation is sleeping between 9 and 11 hours per night. For teenagers, between 8 and 10 hours per night. And for adults, between 7 and 9. Of course, uh, those guidelines are uh, from a population health standpoint. So when we talk to people, we need to adapt on a case-by-case -case basis because we know that our sleep needs are explained mainly by our genes. So it's possible to sleep a bit less than those recommendations and be fine. So I think I'm worried about, but if you 
deviate too much from those recommendations, I will say, especially on the low end side, so the short sleep side, on a chronic basis. So uh, it's not very good for your health over time. So it's the the bad part is not the acute effects of lack of sleep if you don't sleep enough for one night per week, but if on a chronic basis you don't sleep enough, you feel tired and so on, uh, it will not be very good for your health down the road. So uh, as of June 2016, we have for the first time Canadian sleep recommendations that are part of the physical activity guidelines as well. They are called the Canadian 24-hour movement guidelines for children and youth. Uh, also, we try we will expand that in the next years to early years, adults and older adults because we want to make sure that people understand that all of those behaviors are linked together and they in, in influence each other as well. And sleep is one of those behaviors. So get a new night, good night's sleep, try to sit less, try to move more, and all of those things are linked together and with diet too. So for school-age kids, the, the Canadian sleep guidelines are to sleep between 9 and 11 hours per night, and for teenagers, between 8 and 10 hours per night, and try to go to bed and wake up at the same time to avoid this uh, uh, catch-up of sleep on, on weekends. But don't get me wrong here. It's better to catch up on weekends than not doing that, but we still want uh, the kids to go to bed and wake up at the same time every day. That's what the best for your, your body. The more you, you, you stress that, the worse it is. We know that lack of sleep is a stress factor for our metabolism, so we want to have a good night's sleep, and going to bed and wake up at the same time is the best. So if we can find better solutions for the weekdays when kids need to wake up early, I think that will be great. So, but why do we sleep less now compared to decades or years ago? For different reasons, and in fact, the reasons are very different between people as well. Uh, it's not one size fits all. For example, we know that with the advent of the bulb light, uh, we have more artificial light everywhere, and this has an impact on our sleep patterns. You can think about the blue light coming from your screens, your, your tablets, and, and so on, has an impact to reduce your sleep quality. It can be, for example, a late night television watching, the fact that you work too much, family issues, caffeine use, and so on. Uh, Alana was talking about uh, bedtime rules in the hustle. Uh, it can be homework and extracurricular extra ac activities uh, for, for teenagers and, and so on. So there are many reasons why people cut on their sleeping time for pleasure and so on. We all have 24 hours in our day and many people uh, still see sleep as a waste of time. But uh, as I will show you, so no, a good night's sleep is as important as exercising every day and having a good diet for overall health. Uh, so I think in 2016, we should talk about screens. We have screens everywhere, uh, cell phones, tablets, laptops, and people use them before bedtime as well. There is more and more studies showing that if you expose the blue light coming from those screens before bedtime, it reduces your sleep quality. So we know that br the bright light of those screens suppresses the sleep hormone, mel melatonin, which may uh, delay sleep onset. Uh, so I think... Uh, there are many things we can do. For example, if you um, use those screens, there are some apps you can download so the blue light becomes more orange towards the, end of, towards the end of your day. So you can still use those screens, but the impact is less and so on. So people don't realize that. Don't think that there's an effect on their sleep quality. But when we measure objectively in a sleep lab, we see that there is a decrease in sleep quality, even though we don't feel it. So is insufficient sleep a contributor to obesity? The answer is yes. We have a lot of studies right now. So over the past 10 years, uh, both prospective cohort studies showing that short sleepers gain more weight over time, but we have experimental or intervention studies as well showing that when you restrict sleep of people, they eat more, they move less, and they gain weight. So we can say that lack of sleep causes weight gain over time. And it, it, it's on both sides too. So we know that lack of sleep can cause weight gain, but excess body weight can lead to uh, poor sleep quality as well. And that's the same with other behaviors like with lack of uh, exercise. So we know that lack of sleep, uh, you, you feel more tired and you're less likely to move, but also lack of exercise leads to poor sleep quality as well. So it's always uh, this uh, vicious circle. 
So when I say insufficient sleep, I'm talking about short uh, sleep duration and poor sleep quality. They are both very linked and are all they are both associated with excess body weight. So we know that lack of sleep is also associated with not only excess body weight but uh, uh, many other uh, factors for physical health, for mental health, like uh, type two di diabetes, cardiovascular disease, mortality risk. Also linked uh, with unhealthy behaviors, so short sleepers or poor sleepers are more inactive. They engage in more screen time. They have more unhealthy eating behaviors. They tend to crave more for energy-dense foods, high in fat, high in sugar. Uh, they drink more beer, uh, they drink more wine, and they drink more liquor. Uh, there's also effects on anxiety and de depression symptoms. There's also risky behaviors and in injuries. Uh, we can think about car accidents, for example, when people don't sleep enough. Uh, weaker uh, immune system when we don't sleep enough. Poorer academic achievement, so lower grades for kids and for teenagers. And lower quality of life and well-being when we don't sleep enough. And the list goes on and on and on. So again, it's more with the chronic effect of lack of sleep more than the acute effect. So uh, when we look at the mechanisms that can explain why lack of sleep can lead to weight gain and obesity over time, uh, many reasons. The key one is through an increase in food intake. We know that short sleepers eat more for two reasons. They feel more hungry. So lack of sleep is a stress factor for our metabolism. And it changes key appetite hormones like ghrelin, like leptin, like cortisol. So you feel more hungry. But also, when you sleep less, you have more time and more opportunities for eating. For example, if you sleep uh, four hours per night, you're awake for 20. So you're exposed uh, to the obesogenic or the toxic environment for 20 hours a day. So we know that short sleepers snack more, they eat more meals per day, and not necessarily because they feel more hungry. So it's a reward for the brain, and that can explain why short sleepers also drink more, more beer and more wine and, and, and so on. So it's a, it's a fuel for our, our brain, and short sleepers cra crave more, again, for uh, foods high in fat, high in sugar. So way more for pizza and shawarma than for, for uh, fruits and veggies, for example. So that's the, the energy inside of the energy balance equation. So short sleepers eat more. But short sleepers can also uh, move less because you know when you don't sleep enough, you feel more tired. And because of this increased fatigue, so you might be less likely to move and go to the gym, for, for instance. And altogether, it can decrease your 24-hour energy ex expenditure. So you burn less calories. So uh, that's why uh, short sleepers gain weight over time. But beyond uh, sleep quality and sleep duration, I think uh, there's more and more studies uh, looking at sleep timing or bedtime. Or you can think about the chronotype of people, the lark versus the night owl. And uh, I think what uh, recent studies are showing is that for the same amount of sleep, later bedtime is worse uh, because uh, those going to bed late is, is associated with more screen time. And when you engage in screen time, you tend to eat more. So also associated with unhealthy uh, eating behaviors, they tend to move less. And people going to bed late are more overweight and obese as well. So I think we need to think about, yes, duration, about quality, but also about our timing and the behaviors associated with this timing of bedtime. OK, so I was telling you that having a good night's sleep can help you prevent uh, weight gain. But what about uh, when you try to induce weight loss, when we think about the treatment of obesity? So we know that having a good night's sleep can uh, improve the success of weight loss programs that involve diet, that involve moving more. So we know that good sleepers lose more weight compared to poor sleepers when they uh, embark in those weight loss programs. So lack of sleep can undermine the success of weight loss programs. So we published a paper a couple of year, years ago with my uh, former supervisor, Angelo Tremblay. And also, we know that sleep is also part of the five A's of obesity management from the Canadian Obesity Network. So because we need to, to ask questions about sleep, it can be a confounding factor. We know that short uh, sleep impacts eating behaviors and physical activity behaviors. So if you don't even ask questions about sleep, and short sleepers are already more hungry. You cut calories in their diet, they will feel even more hungry. So they are less likely to be compliant with their diet. 
and short sleepers are more tired and they're less likely to, to move. And if you ask them to move more, it's not going to happen very well. So if you don't ask questions about sleep, it can explain why uh, your uh, weight loss programs fail. And people ask me sometimes, okay, GP, I'm obese, I'm a short sleeper. If I sleep more, can I expect to lose weight? So you snooze, you lose weight. So, and my answer is no. But the good news here is that if you change your bad sleeping habits into good sleeping habits, you can prevent future weight gain. So that's a good thing. So we were the first group to show that a couple of years ago. You have here a group of adults. The control group on the left-hand side are adults sleeping at a good zone between seven and nine hours per night. Those in the middle were short sleepers, so adults sleeping less than six hours per, six hours per night, and they increased their sleep duration from less than six to seven to eight. And on the right-hand side, you have the chronic short sleepers, those sleeping less than six hours every night. The follow-up was six years, and you can see the change in fat mass over time. So the chronic short sleepers on the right-hand side gain about four kilos over time, but there was no significant differences between the control group and those who increase their sleep duration. So two good news for me here. First of all, it's possible to change bad sleeping habits into good sleeping habits, and by doing so, you don't lose weight, but you prevent future weight gain, which is uh, probably a very good thing. So overall, I think that there is minimal risk in taking a pragmatic approach and encouraging a good night's sleep as an adjunct to other health promotion measures. So we talk a lot about the big two factors that are diet and exercise, but why not uh, the big three? So I think there's it's probably much more complex than that. There's many factors that can impact health, but we sleep about one third of our lives. And we know that sleeping habits impact eating behaviors and physical activity behaviors. So at least ask questions about sleep because it can influence uh, those two very important behaviors. And I think we, we talk a lot about the diet and exercise with regard to body weight. Not a lot about sleep, not about, about sleep, even though we talk more and more about it. But I think it's uh, we neglect a bit sleep in our lives, mainly because we don't take sleep uh, seriously in our society. I think uh, people still see that as a waste of time. So what kind of questions? So if you're a clinician, for example, if you ask me, okay, GP, what? I don't have a lot of time to ask questions about sleep. So what are the key questions that I should ask? So I think the three key sleep uh, dimensions are duration, uh, quality, and timing. And I just published a paper in 2016, a review paper on sleep, and I put a list of six questions there. So first of all, so what time do you go to bed every night and wake up every morning? So this paper was for uh, children and, and teenagers. So uh, it should be uh, consistent, so even on weekends. So try to not, uh, not have too much this catch up, catch up sleep on weekends. The second one, how many hours do you sleep on average per night? So 10 to 13 hours for preschoolers, 9 to 11 for school age kids, and between 8 and 10 for teenagers. The third one, do you have difficulty falling asleep once in bed? So the, the good answer should be no, I fall asleep within 30 minutes or less. The fourth one, how many times you wake up each night? The good answer should be never or once per night. Do you feel refreshed uh, upon waking in the morning? Should be yes. And the last one, how often do you feel sleepy during the day? So it should be never or rarely. So if the answers are not the good one, so I think you need to try to address the root causes of the problem. And this can be different between people, so you try, you try to find solutions that can be adapted to the, to the patient, and hopefully you can change that. Because, of course, as I told you, uh, your sleeping habits will impact your eating behaviors and your physical activity behaviors, and the success of your program. There are many tips also that we can talk about when we talk about sleep, and you know uh, many of them. Elena talked about some of those, so it's important to go to bed and wake up at the same time every day, even on the weekends. Uh, avoid the caffeine con consumption uh, starting in the late afternoon. Expose yourself to bright light in the morning. Sunlight helps the biological clock to reset itself each day. Make sure your bedroom is conducive to sleep, should be dark, should be quiet, should be comfortable and cool. 
sleep on a comfortable mattress and pillow. So again, you spend about one third of your, of your life uh, sleeping. So invest a bit on a good uh, mattress and a good pillow. Don't go to bed feeling hungry, but don't also eat a, a heavy meal like a large steak before going to bed, but it's good to snack before going to bed. Develop a relaxing routine before bedtime, like bathing, like music, like some reading, but not too intense uh, mental workload. Reserve your bedroom for sleeping only. So that's a key uh, advice here. Keep uh, cell phones, computers, televisions, and all gadgets out of your bedroom. If you still keep your cell phone in your bedroom, uh, at least uh, have it in, in the sleeping mode so you don't receive texts and uh, so you preserve your sleep quality. Another very good tip here, exercise regularly during your day. So many people ask me, JP, I don't sleep well. Do you have a good tip for me? And the first question I ask them, so if they don't have a sleep problems, so are you active every day? And we know that in Canada, not many people meet the physical activity guidelines. Only about 10% of kids move enough and only about 15% of adults move enough. So I think there's clearly a physical inactivity epidemic in Canada. And we know the benefits of being active on sleep quality. So when you go to bed feeling tired, physically tired, you sleep much better. But when you're mentally tired with mental stress, uh, you don't sleep well. So I think uh, being active help, helps you to have a good balance uh, between physical work and mental work and to reduce the stress and this mental stress as well. So it helps you to sleep much better. And don't have pets in your, your bedroom because it will uh, disrupt your sleep quality. <clears throat> and this is one study that we published a couple of years ago with my Danish uh, and Swedish colleagues. So showing again that uh, if you're moving, if you exercise every day, you, your sleep quality is much better. So uh, in conclusions, I have uh, four take home messages for you. First of all, sleep is not a waste of time. So we know that in our society, uh, we, are, we all have 24 hours in our day. But I think it's important to invest on sleep. Sleep is as important as eating well and ex exercising every day for overall health. And sleep impacts eating behaviors and physical activity behaviors to impact body weight as well. Short sleep duration, poor sleep quality and late bedtime. So all of those three uh, sleep uh, aspects are all associated with increased food intake. Poor diet quality, high in fat, high in sugar, and excess body weight. Sleep hygiene is an important factor to consider not only in the prevention of excess body weight, but also in the treatment, so it will improve the success of weight loss programs. And the right amount of sleep should be uh, adapted on a case-by-case -case basis. We have sleep recommendations for public health, but uh, it's possible that some people uh, may sleep a bit less than that and be okay. But I, I think as a rule of thumb, if you need an alarm clock to wake up every morning to go to work or to go to, to school, that means that you're sleep deprived and probably you will have some catch up sleep on weekends. So I think uh, there's a lot of, peop of uh, people sleep deprived in Canada, one third of kids and teenagers and a lot of adults as well. And I think uh, we can do better in the next few years. So thank you very much. And here are uh, my uh, email address if you want to uh, ask me some questions if you want to talk more about that and Dr. Alana LeBlanc emailed uh, address as well here. And thank you again to Khan for, for this. So ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much. That concludes our webinar for today. And thank you to Dr. LeBlanc and Chef for sharing this information. And thank you to all of you for taking the time to join today. For those of you that use social media, you can tweet to us using hashtag obesity talk Send us a message on Facebook or click the survey box in the window of your screen and complete the sur short survey. You may now disconnect and close your browser and we hope you have a great day.